All right, Hebrews chapter 12. And you can see it in verse 1, wherefore seeing we, the apostle, referring to those of us believers still here upon the earth, we also are compassed, means surrounded, about with so great a cloud of witnesses. And we are, we are compassed, surrounded uh, by all the believers who have gone before us. And coming out of chapter 11, uh, the believers are listed by name, but it's not, you know, uh, the list of all believers, but it's representative of believers and uh, uh, great men uh, and women of great faith are listed in chapter 11. And so uh, now, um, <clears throat> so these witnesses have, have gone home to be with the Lord. You know, you know, Jesus helps us to understand about these witnesses that surround us that, um, you know, and they're witnesses, they're witnesses in the, in the sense that while they were here upon the earth, they witnessed, but now that they're in heaven, they're witnessing us. And, uh, you know, see how we're going to run our race. They've run their race. Their race is finished. They're home. And uh, now they're witnessing us as we run our race for the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 22 is helpful. So let's um, look at uh, Matthew chapter 22. And so I guess what I'm saying is, you know, and we're being watched, being watched by heaven above as well as by our peers, our contemporaries here upon the earth. We're being watched. <clears throat> and um, verse 29 through 33, and that is again Matthew chapter 22 and uh, verse 29. Um, Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God, for in the resurrection, uh, the life beyond this earthly sojourn, this earthly pilgrimage, and in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. But as touching the resurrection of, of the dead, have you not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob? God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. They've gone on to be with the Lord. They're alive and they're witnessing those of us who are still upon the earth and uh, and they were astonished by his doctrine, Luke chapter 20. And so we're surrounded by just a great host of onlookers, you know, witnesses uh, in Luke and chapter number 20 and verse number 38. For he is not a God of the dead, but of the living for all live unto him. It's because of him that we all live. And it's only because of him uh, that we all live. And, you know, many religions teach that, that you know, after death, that's it. You, you go into the ground, that's it. There's nothing else. Well, I'm sorry. Uh, and I am not sorry. And I'm glad to report that uh, death is not the cessation of life. It's actually the beginning of eternal life. Although, that begins the moment Jesus comes into your life. And uh, as we think about these witnesses back in Hebrews chapter 11, there is Abel. Remember, 
uh, who gave a more excellent sacrifice to God, Abel offering the lamb and the blood of the lamb, uh, showing God that he trusted, believed in the lamb of God, Jesus Christ. There was Enoch. Enoch, these, these are the witnesses in the grandstand of heaven. Enoch translated uh, a foretype of the rapture, uh, did not see death. And why? Because he pleased God. He pleased God. And we know he pleased God because he, uh, he walked by faith. Uh, there was Noah. Noah never saw a drop of rain. And, and uh, having never seen a drop of rain, uh, believed uh, the word of God and so built the ark and uh, upon the completion of the ark condemned the world because God's judgment would not fall upon the world until the ark was built. And so Noah and his wife, his three sons and their wives were saved from the wrath of God uh, when the ark was completed. And only then did the judgment of God fall upon uh, the, uh, the world uh, that God was regretting that he, he had even made man because of their wickedness, their evil. And there was Abraham, Abraham who, uh, who sojourned in uh, the promised land, uh, not knowing where he went. He just took the step of faith because God told him to do so. He didn't know where he was going. Uh, he just sojourned, and uh, and so he lived by faith. And and there was Sarah, Sarah, his his wife, who uh, now past age uh, of childbearing, uh, she conceived. And why? Because she believed God. She judged God faithful. Uh, there was Isaac, who submitted to being sacrificed. Uh, Isaac, uh, who along with his father Abraham, did believe in the resurrection, believed uh, that if he uh, was uh, killed upon that altar of sacrifice, believed that uh, he would rise again. Uh, there was Jacob believed uh, Jesus uh, would come through his lineage, come through his family, and indeed Jesus came through Jacob. And why is that? Because Jacob believed Esau was profane, uh, his brother, uh, but Jacob believed and, yes, was a progenitor of Jesus Christ uh, insofar as the uh, physical is concerned. And there was Joseph, uh, Joseph who died in Egypt, yet said to his uh, family, uh, carry my bones uh, forth from this place uh, with you when you uh, exit Egypt. Uh, he just believed that God would uh, take Israel out of Egypt and uh, believed it so strongly, he said, take my remains with you and uh, so that I can rest in the promised land waiting for the return of Messiah there. There was Moses believed in uh, the heavenly reward over sinful pleasure, believed so strongly that he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, but chose to suffer with uh, the people of God uh, because uh, he believed so strongly uh, that the blessing of God was worth more than the sinful pleasures of uh, a uh, life here upon the earth. There was Rahab. Remember, Rahab perished not uh, and uh, because she helped save the spies as uh, they went into the promised land. And, um, and so she perished not because she acted in faith and saved the, uh, the Hebrew spies. There was Gideon. Gideon's army outnumbered more than 10 to 1, won a victory because Gideon believed God. Uh, there was Samson who suffered. Yes, he suffered a, 
a great failure in his life because of his disobedience uh, to God's word. However, we see the mercy of God. Uh, he prevailed nevertheless over the Philistines um, and uh, using the jawbone of, of, an, of an ass, of a donkey, uh, he was victorious over 3,000 uh, Philistine uh, combatants. There was David, uh, string bean David, the ruddy youth, fought an almost 10 foot tall giant when the entire Israeli army was paralyzed by fear, King Saul hiding in his tent, here came the shepherd boy David and said that uh, there is a cause and that cause is uh, the truth of God's word and uh, salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll go out, I'll fight him and uh, and all of that by faith. Now, all of our predecessors are watching you and I run our race. Hebrews chapter 12, and uh, the Bible says there in verse 1, uh, that uh, let us lay aside every weight. Let us lay aside every weight uh, and the sin. Um, and the sin. And so notice the sin, not sins plural. There is a particular sin. And we can know what that particular sin is because of what chapter 11 is all about. Now remember, there were no chapter and verse divisions in the scriptures, those were added by man. They're not inspired. And, and sometimes they interfere with the continuity and the flow of uh, the whole thought uh, being conveyed in God's word. And this may be one of those places, but chapter 11 is, uh, uh, well, you can look at verse one, now faith. Chapter 11 is all, all about faith and uh, the, the sin, the sin uh, that we need to lay aside, which that, uh, that sin that derails us, that, that sin that get that knocks us out of our race uh, and and running that race in in the way that God wills for us to uh, to do so is the sin uh, of unbelief unbelief is the sin and uh, so I'll read uh, verse 6 of chapter 11 uh, but without faith it is impossible to please him for he that cometh to God must, must do what, class? Believe. Must believe. You must believe that he is. And, uh, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Making him uh, the priority of life. Making him the most important uh, person in life. Uh, must believe, and so this sin that so easily does beset us, that knocks us out of our race, that uh, even disqualifies us, is the sin of unbelief. Now, and uh, I think about these words of Jesus in Mark chapter 11 uh, and, and verse 22 and on in Mark chapter 11. Powerful words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mark 11 and verse 22. And Jesus answering said unto them. And what did he say unto them? Have faith in God. No matter what. Come what may. Have faith in God. For verily Jesus goes on to say. I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, and sometimes it seems like we uh, face some real mountain-sized problems in life, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou 
cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall, but shall do what class? Shall believe, you see it there. But shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, shall have whatsoever he saith. It all is contingent upon believing, having faith, because without faith it's impossible to please him. And then in verse 24, uh, Jesus uh, caps it off with this statement, Therefore I say unto you, what things soever ye desire when ye talk to God. That's what prayer is. Prayer is talking to God. When you talk to God, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. And so uh, God wants us to lay aside the, this uh, sin of unbelief. Notice, uh, and uh, there's more, Hebrews. Let's go back to Hebrews and uh, chapter 3. And uh, we'll look at uh, a little bit in chapter 4. But Hebrews chapter 3, uh, God wants us to believe. It is the prerequisite for all that God will do is that we will believe, believe, believe his word, believe, believe him, believe in him. Hebrews chapter 3 and uh, verse 17 through 19, uh, but, with, but with whom was he grieved? Do you want to know what grieves God? Do you want to, you want to know what grieves the Holy Spirit? You know, we're commanded to grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. That's command. We're not to grieve. We're not to grieve God. What is it that grieves God? Well, the Bible says, uh, but with whom was he grieved 40 years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? Well, what, what was the sin? What was the sin? Well, the Bible tells us in verse 18, and to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that to them that what, class? There's no rest apart from believing God. It is the sin that will beset, so easily besets us, knocks us out of our race, disqualifies us, um, hobbles us, you might say, hinders us, and it grieves God. And... Uh, But to them that believed not, at verse 19, so we see that they could not enter in because of, of one single besetting sin, because of unbelief. And in chapter 4, he continues in chapter 4 and verse 1, let us therefore fear lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest. And by the way, that's all you get. All you get from God is a promise. And then God watches what your response is to his promise. Let us therefore fear lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest And there is rest in believing God. There is rest in believing God's promise of salvation upon our repentance and acceptance of Jesus Christ. There is rest in believing God's promise for provision that my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. There is rest in believing God's promise of protection. God says, I will keep thee, means I will guard you, I will protect you. There's rest. But only if you believe the promises of God. There's rest in believing his promise to return. I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. There's rest 
in knowing that it's not going to be like this for an endless number of tomorrows. There's an end to this. And Jesus has promised to return for his own let us therefore fear lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest any of you should seem to come short of it for unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them but the word preached did not profit them and why didn't it profit them not being mixed with mixed with what class you got to mix the faith. you got to believe. For God's word to profit you, for God's prof promises to profit you and benefit you, God wants you to believe him. Why is that God's, God's arrangement? Because believing God, having faith in God, keeps you reliant upon God, keeps you depending upon God. That's the way it works. That's faith. Faith is trusting, believing God. And that keeps you close to God, depending on God, leaning upon God, walking with God. That's God's divine arrangement. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed to enter into rest. Do you know how to escape worry and fear and anxiety, all of which torment the soul? Do you know how to escape it? Just believe God. Just believe God. Just believe God. Drop down to verse 6, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in. And why could they not come into God's rest? Because of unbelief. In verse 11, let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of, of unbelief. Do you have a problem that's too big for God to take care of? Well, I don't know what you're going to do if you have a problem that's too big for God to take care of. You can focus on that problem or you can focus on God's promises. Take your choice. Take your pick. Focus on God's promises or focus on the problem. You focus on God's promises and believe God's promises, the problem is solved. The details are left to God. When, what, where, how, I don't know. That's where faith comes in. You're called to do one thing. You're called, I'm called, to believe that God will do what he promises to do. That's your responsibility before God, is to believe God. And when you become responsible in believing, trusting God, he'll work it out. They could not enter in because they would not believe God. I don't know, I guess they thought maybe they could handle it better than God. I don't know. Like some people think they can handle it better than God. I, I don't. We go back to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. And so, uh, now, you know, <clears throat> we're, we're being, we have a, we're surrounded by a heavenly host. We're surrounded by <clears throat> all of these men and women of God who've gone on to be with the Lord. We're compassed by them. And remember, God is not the God of the dead, but the, the God of the living. These folks are alive. 
They've just changed their, their location. They're now in heaven. We're still on earth. We're going to join them if we know Jesus Christ is our personal Savior. And they're watching. They're observing. And so we're to lay aside uh, the sin which doth so easily beset us, and that's the sin of unbelief. And uh, in its place, we are to believe, trust, have faith. And uh, we're to run with patience. We're to run with patience. The race that is set before us, the race that is set before who set the race? Who set the race before us? Who did that? Who? That's God. God sets the race before us. He set the race before you. The race before me. The race before every child of His. God sets that race before us, and we're to run it with patience, persistence, endurance. And where are we going to get that from? You know. Yeah. Have you ever noticed how easy it is to quit and give up? Have you ever quit and give up? <laughs> so easy to quit and give up. You know, the problem with quitting and you know what the problem with quitting and giving up is? You know what the problem with that is? You gotta look, go look in the mirror, amen. <laughs> yeah. You gotta live with yourself. And it's not easy. You gotta live with yourself. That's not so easy. Oh, the booth. Oh, that booth. Wow. <laughs> uh, we've got to get central air conditioning in that booth. Don't you, don't you fellas agree? Amen. We got to do something. <laughs> you know, I, you know, I, I, it seems such a simple thing, but it's not, it's a, it's a major, it's a major event <laughs> helping these young people get to Bible camp where they can get the counsel, get the encouragement, get the word of God to strengthen and fortify, uplift them, encourage them, help them. I mean, they live in a world that is trying to take them down. It just seems like it's really, the world really hones in on young people, on, on destroying um, young people. It, it's a major event. <clears throat> it, do you realize in the, in the 20, what, two, 22 years we, my wife and I have been here, do you realize uh, because of the fundraising, because of men and women, boys and girls willing to give their lives away to help raise funding, do you realize boys and girls have gotten to go to camp, have gotten to go to Bible conference, conferences for young people who have never been beyond the border of this city? Do you realize that? We're talking teenagers, junior high schoolers, Elementary kids, they've never been out of this city. Why is that? Didn't have the money. Didn't have the resource. Didn't have the way to go to a Bible conference with hundreds or thousands of other young people sitting under the preaching of God's word and uh, Bible camp and have that experience of being drawn closer to God because they get out of the whole system, away from the cell phone, away from the technology, away from all of the distractions, and uh, the Word of God just permeates their being. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I got to tell you, it was a good feeling. <laughs> it was a good feeling. I don't know that I've ever been so glad in a long, long time when we came to the end of the booth. Were you guys glad? I was glad. I was really glad it was over. And um, were you glad, Mrs. Smith? You were glad. Were you? Were you? Were you guys glad, Wes and Diesel, that the booth was over? You were glad. One of you was glad. One of you wasn't glad. All right. All right. You know. Um, do you know if Brother Jason was glad? Okay. Well. Um, but let me tell you, it was a good feeling. It was a good feeling to come to the end of those 115 plus days in that plywood box <laughs> and to know that we finished. Amen? That we finished. We didn't quit. We didn't give up. <laughs> it's a good feeling. Amen? I mean, I, I got to say, I'd be ashamed. I'd be ashamed. I don't know that I could stand before you if I had quit. 
if I had taken that wonderful uh, towel, whatever that's called, off of my neck that, that my wife uh, found and you make it wet and, and, and it freezes you, you know, it's, it's an incredible piece of, if I'd taken the towel and thrown it in and said, I, I quit, I don't think I could stand before you. I couldn't face you. You know? Um, the Bible says run with patience. Do you know what that means? That means don't quit. Don't quit. What's so hard? It's so hard. Well, well, keep trusting. Keep trusting. Keep believing. Yes. If it were easy, there'd be more people doing it. Amen. Easy. That's what the world's into. Easy. Look at this. Now, where am I going to get this? stick to itiveness. Where am I going to get this endurance? Where am I going to get this persistence, this patience? Where, how am I going to get this? Well, look at Romans chapter 5. I'll, God will tell you where you're going to get it from. It, God wants you to finish your race. And by the way, um, now, have any of you noticed, uh, did any of you run when you were a, a young person? Did any of you actually ever run when you were, um, you know, say what, uh, 6, 10, 15 years old, 20 years old? I think I could still run when I was 20 years old. I think I could. Um, and uh, have you noticed it gets a little harder to run? As the years go by, you know, how many of you are still running? I'm, I'm still running. <laughs> okay. All right. You, you get the point. I think you, I think you get the point. Well, the point is, it doesn't get easier. It doesn't get easier. In fact, it becomes increasingly difficult. Okay. Now, I, I, I can still run <laughs> with my grandsons up in Utah and they were, they wanted to play tag. And you know they thought uh, I would I would be uh, easy to uh, defeat, and uh, they found out Grandpa can still run. I can still run in very short bursts. I cannot run a long long way. But um, where am I going to get this patience that God wants me to have so that I'll not uh, quit my race? Well, here it is. <clears throat> Maybe you've already seen it. Romans chapter 5 and verse number 3. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations. Glory means we thank God, we praise God for troubles. Uh, knowing, that, knowing that tribulation, what, what does God bring into our lives from tribulation? Tribulation worketh what? Do you see it there? Can you believe that? You better believe it. It's the Word of God. We get this patience that God wants us to have to finish our race. We get it from tribulations. We get it from trouble. But look what James, maybe James frames it just a little bit differently. James chapter 1. James chapter 1 and verse number 3, uh, James says, Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Trying means the testing of your faith. And your faith will be tested with all kinds of trials, troubles. And uh, the, the end result is patience. It's patience. And then the race, uh, back to Hebrews Chapter 12, there is the race itself in uh, we're to run with patience, the race. <clears throat> what about the race? Well, uh, God speaks to the race and uh, we're in a race. First uh, Corinthians chapter nine. We're in a race. <clears throat> we need to run it by faith. We need to finish our race. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse number 24 <clears throat> and on through verse number 27 but uh, knowing 
know ye that, know ye not, pardon me, that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize, so run that ye may obtain the prize. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Uh, uh, that, is, uh, that is the discipline of the child of God, that temperate uh, is to be under uh, God's control, the, the control of the Holy Spirit of God, uh, not the flesh. Now, they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, uh, doesn't last. It was usually an olive wreath placed upon the head in the Olympics of Paul, the apostles day and time. Uh, but we are running to obtain an incorruptible crown. The importance of that crown, the significance of that crown is that we can then uh, place that or cast that uh, to the feet of Jesus in heaven as a testimony of our uh, belief, our trust, our faith, and more importantly, our love, our love for him. Because we ran with patience, we didn't quit, we didn't give up, and, and uh, we, we did it by faith, which is God's way, and, um, and so we're not standing there empty-handed in heaven. Uh, we're not saved by works, we're saved by his grace, and that's only because of his mercy. But how nice it would be to appear before him with a crown that we have won because we uh, ran with patience. The race that God set before us. I, uh, Paul says, I therefore so run not as uncertainly so fight I. He says, I'm not pretending. He says, I'm not shadow boxing. He says, I'm not playing a game here. He says, not as one that beateth the air, uh, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway or be disqualified. And so uh, what are we racing for? Does anyone want to venture a guess? What are we racing? What are we in a race for? Um, say what? Precious souls, precious souls for whom Jesus has died. Uh, and looking unto Jesus, looking unto Jesus, verse 2 of our text, Hebrews 12, 2, looking unto Jesus. We better have a focal point. Um, looking unto Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith what you look at is what you think about what you look at is the direction you go what you look at becomes your focal point of reference who for the joy who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Look at this, despising the shame. Uh, yeah, I don't even know if, I don't know if you can relate. Do, do, you know, do you know what it's like to be ashamed? Do you know what it's like to go through the emotions of shame. You see, um, usually people are shamed or become ashamed when what happens? When, what, ha what happens generally uh, that leads to a person be, being ashamed or shamed? Anybody? They, they, they got caught. They got caught doing wrong. And, 
and it becomes it becomes uh, known. It becomes known. You see, Jesus took how many sins of the world into himself? All of them. Every sinful, wicked, disobedient sin Jesus took into himself. <laughs> and he despised the shame, despising the shame. He who knew no sin became sin, and he experienced shame. Um, how incredible is that? Uh, but, but here's the point I, I want to bring you to. Who for the joy, verse 2, who for the joy that was set before him, what, what would compel him to do this, to take all of this shame, to become guilty? Not of his own sins, but of our sins. Wow. Um, you think about all the wicked, heinous, evil things that people do. Uh, well, all of that shame went to Jesus. You know, and and, and what, what was the effect that it had between Jesus and his heavenly father, all of that shame, all of that guilt, it, it caused his heavenly father to do what? Do you remember what his heavenly father did? What did Jesus say as he hung on the cross to his heavenly father? He said, why hast thou forsaken me? That, that shame should have been ours. But Jesus took it. And when he took it, the Father turned his back on Jesus. Wow. It's like, you know, it's like, it's like, I don't know you anymore. I'm ashamed of you. And... And that's really the essence of what the Father was communicating by turning his back. I'm ashamed of you. And that's what we deserved, but that's what he took. And, and why? Well, it was for the joy. It was for the joy set before him. Now, what is that joy that was set before him? Luke chapter 15. This is why he did it. That's why he took the shame that caused his father to turn his, turn his back on his son to forsake him. <laughs> Total, total breakdown in the relationship. Luke 15 and verse 3, and I'll read through verse 7. <clears throat> As we think about the joy that was set before him, and he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it. And when he hath found it, he layeth it upon, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing, who for the joy that was set before him, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. If you're a believer, that's you. That's why he took all of your shame, shame that, shame on you, shame on me, shame on this world. He took it all so that you could be found. And he did it for the joy that was set before him so that you could spend forever with him. What are you going to do forever? You're going to thank him. You're going to love him. You're going to praise him. You're going to worship him. You're going to serve him. <laughs> You're going to do that forever because of what he did for you. Verse 7, I say unto you, that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth. There is no salvation apart from repentance. More than over 99 just persons, which need no repentance, speaking to the self-righteous Pharisees. Well, they needed to repent. They just didn't think they needed to repent. 
that for the joy that was set before him. And uh, despising the shame. And then look at this back in our text, Hebrews chapter 12. And uh, so beyond all of, uh, of that, uh, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God, set down. You, you know when you sit down is when the job is finished. And that's something else he said from the cross. It is finished. Now, we'll conclude with these few scriptures as we look at verse 3 before consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. Because every sin you've ever sinned was put on him. Every sin I've ever sinned was put on him. Every sin that this world has ever sinned was put on him. Such contradiction of sinners against himself. Consider him and what he went through, what he endured, lest ye be wearied and faint. Or you want to quit or give up in your mind. Anytime you think you've got it rough, time you think you've got it bad, think about what he had to go through. Now, uh, he endured such contradiction of sinners. Isaiah chapter, we'll go as fast as we can through these final verses here. Isaiah chapter 50. Um, consider him which endured such contradiction of sinners, lest ye be wearied and faint means to quit and give up. But there's a problem with quitting and giving up. You gotta live with yourself. I don't know if you've ever quit anything, but not only do you have to live with yourself, you gotta live with everybody else that knows you quit and gave up. And that, that just spells shame. <laughs> Look at, uh, Isaiah chapter 50 and verse number six, I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the, the hair. I hid not my face from, from what? I hid not my face from shame and spitting. Uh, Isaiah 53 and verse number five, so anytime, you know, you're, you're thinking you've got it rough, you've got it hard, things are bad. Well, you know what God says to do? Think about what he went through. Uh, I, Isaiah 53 uh, and verse number five, but he was, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. And, and you go to the Hebrew word for bruised, it means beaten to pieces. He was literally beaten to pieces. <laughs> Uh, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Mark 15, would you please hurry now, Mark 15, and uh, we'll close on these final few verses. Mark chapter 15. Because we're thinking about him, uh, when, as we go through trials and we go through problems and we go through struggles and we go through all of life's headwinds and reversals and struggles and you know what God says, think on him lest you be weary and faint in your mind. Uh, look at this, Mark 15 and verse number 34 and uh, at the ninth hour Jesus cried um, with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It's because of all your sin and my sin in his body. Luke 22, Luke 22 and verse 44. Luke 22 and verse number 44. Uh, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And look at this. His sweat was as it were great drops of blood 
falling down to the ground. And that is a condition that is produced. Uh, medical doctors uh, have looked at this and, and commented on this. It is an actual condition that is, uh, that is the result of great stress, pressure. Can you imagine the pressure that Jesus Christ was under as he was on his way to the cross? Hebrews chapter 2, please. <clears throat> Hebrews, so, you know, Hebrews chapter number 2 and verse uh, number 10, number 10 and 18. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10 and verse 18, for it is because of him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their uh, salvation perfect through sufferings. Jesus, in other words, perfected that as he finished, he completed the work that God gave him to do. And he did so uh, through sufferings, sufferings, the Bible says. And then verse 18, for in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor or comfort them that are tempted. You, you, got, a, you got a problem? You got something going in your, on in your life that is testing your faith, that is, that is uh, screaming inside of you to quit and give up? God says go to him. He's been through it. He understands it. He knows how to help you. He knows what to do about it. Go to him with it. Don't quit. Don't give up. I mean, honestly, do, do you really want to stand before the throne of God in heaven? having quit and given up? I mean, really? I don't think so. I don't think so. I think you want to finish. I think you want to run with patience the race that God has set before you. Uh, Hebrews 13 and verse number 12, wherefore Jesus also that he might sanctify the people with his own blood suffered without the gate. Without the gate, that's the rejection. Without the gate, that's the isolation. Without the gate, that's the hatred. He's been through it. He's been through it all. Manifold times more than any of us will ever go through. First Peter, finally, 1 Peter chapter 3. And we're done. 1 Peter chapter 3. And uh, verse number 18 for Christ also hath suffered hath once suffered for sins the just for the unjust the unjust that's us before Christ comes into our lives but now we're just uh, that he might bring us, why did he do it? That he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. May God bless his word. Father, we pray you will bless your word. Um, you've set a race before us, and we're to run it with patience. That, that race started the day that Jesus came into our life. And no matter what happens in our life, we're to do one thing. We're to believe that you will do everything you've promised us you will do. That's our one responsibility that we have is to believe that you will do all that you have promised us you will do. We're to believe. We're to keep the faith. Paul said, I have kept the faith. Paul said, I have finished. Paul was not a quitter. He was a finisher. And so 
he will not have to hang his head low in shame because he finished. And my prayer is that none of us will have to hang our heads low in shame because we quit you. One thing is for sure, you didn't quit us. And so no matter what happens, no matter what happens, dear God, help us to keep trusting you, believing you, putting our faith in you. God bless your word. And God save the lost. And God encourage the saints. Because uh, we're not home yet. We're not there yet. We're as good as there, but we're just not there yet. And we're not there yet because you want us to share the gospel with others. Because God would that none should perish, but that all should come under repentance. So God help us to use our time wisely, whatever time we have left. God bless your word in Jesus' name as we